Some time ago, I was invited to preach at a retirement home. It was a very large one with many levels or stories in the building. And so when they gathered in one big room, I was there speaking to the people. And afterward, you know, some people said this and said that to me. But one particular person came up to me and said, you shouldn't speak in such a soft voice. And you ought to speak right into the microphone. I couldn't hear anything you said. And a little later, I went to see someone who was living on the sixth floor of that building. And they had listened over the intercom. And they said, you were loud and clear as a bell. I hadn't told them about the other comment. And so I decided, perhaps, if they could hear me on the sixth floor, that it wasn't my soft voice or my distance from the microphone. Perhaps that person had a bit of a hearing difficulty. And there is a challenge, not just for older people whose ears are not quite what they used to be, but for many folks when it comes to the things of God. They wonder, God, why don't you make yourself more obvious? Why don't you make your reality easier to see and your voice easier to hear? And a good deal even of Christian attempts to communicate with people who have those objections is to provide some arguments and some evidence and ways of persuading. But our Lord Jesus himself says that there's more to it than just giving more light. Better eyes are needed than giving a louder voice. Better ears are needed. And so let's hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says in two passages of the Bible. They're very similar passages, but rather than just say, ah, they're pretty much the same, I'll read them both. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. And then from Luke chapter 11, no one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light, but when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. This thins the reading of God's word and God always blesses his word to those who listen. We read those two passages about the need for a good eye in order for the body to be full of light. And it sounds much the same. And if we dig into it, I think we'll find that the meaning of those two passages is much the same. But Jesus spoke those in different contexts. In Luke chapter 11, he's speaking to people who are demanding signs, wanting evidence, thinking that Jesus should give more proof of who he is. In Matthew 6, he's in the middle of the great Sermon on the Mount, and he's in the middle of talking about treasure in heaven or treasure on earth and having God as your master or money as your master. And so it's very helpful not just to look at what a particular statement says, but where it is said. Because you want to look at the statement itself and understand it, but very often it's the context that tells us a lot about how to apply it. Jesus made this statement in Luke chapter 11 after there were some people who were demanding signs. There were some people in the crowds who said that Jesus spoke and acted by the power of Satan. 
That wasn't very nice. In fact, it was a very serious problem. But there were others who, though they might not accuse him of being Satan's ambassador, still said, we want a sign. And so to those people, Jesus said that they would get only one, the sign of Jonah. And he said, you know what? When Jonah spoke to that terrible, wicked city of Nineveh, they repented. Somebody greater than Jonah is here. When the queen of Sheba heard about the wisdom of Solomon and his greatness, she traveled a long ways to find out for herself. And when she got there, she said that Solomon was even greater than all those rumors about him. And Jesus said, I tell you, someone greater than Solomon is here. And he said, you want a sign? Only one, the sign of Jonah. What's the sign of Jonah? Well, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so Jesus would be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. And that would be the great sign of who Jesus is. But even that great sign would not cut through the blindness of those who already were busy rejecting him. Jesus had come and they had heard his teaching. They had even seen some of his miracles and still they were demanding signs. At that point, it was not a problem of needing more light. It was a problem of needing better eyes. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is in the Sermon on the Mount and he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And speaking of the heart, your eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. But if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. And then he says, if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. You must either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So he's talking about treasure in heaven and having God as your master or seeking only treasure on earth and having money as your master. And when you have that kind of a situation, Jesus says in both cases, whether you're the kind of person who thinks that the mind needs more evidence, just make sure your mind and your spirit are actually working the way they should be. If you're the kind of person who doesn't have time for Jesus because you know what? I'm making a living getting comfortable, having the stuff money can buy, um, the world revolves around money. If you're in that kind of situation, you have a vision problem. You don't yet see things as they are. You don't realize that earthly treasure vanishes and heavenly treasure lasts forever. So Jesus speaks in these different contexts. The, the meaning is much the same. We need our spirit or our heart organs, the spiritual eyes, to be renewed in order for the light of Jesus to get in. And we need that uh, even more than we need another sign. And we need that when we're tempted to just get caught up in all the stuff we see with these eyeballs and can't see anything with our spiritual eyeballs. Again, Jesus says the real problem is not a lack of light. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I have come into the world as light, that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. The light has come. The light is right in front of you. And if you can't see the light, you should not necessarily go around saying, somebody please turn on the light. Why don't you turn on the lights around here? There is no light. The problem is with the eyes. And Jesus is saying very clearly, okay, if light is what you want, light is here. But 
do you have the sense organs inwardly to receive the light that God has sent, the light of Jesus Christ? We're going to look at being full of light, but before we do that, I just want to contrast it, as Jesus does, with darkness on the inside. Already in the Old Testament, Proverbs says, Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked are sin. It's a terrible situation when your lamp is sin, when your lamp actually gives no light. And Jesus then echoes that, if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? If your eyes aren't letting light into your body, your body is not guided by or sensitive to light at all. And so when you're Dark on the inside, you're blind to the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're blind to the light that God gives in his word. You can't see what God is conveying. You cannot sense who God is. And when you're blind to God's light, that also results in walking in darkness. The Bible says the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They don't know what makes them stumble. They're blind to themselves. One of the most terrible things that afflicts all of us when we have a sin in our life is we can't even see ourselves the way other people see us, let alone the way God sees us. We've got a really strange view where we can't necessarily see our own errors and our own sins. We're blind to ourselves and we're blind to the reality of God to the reality of Jesus to the truth of the Bible. We need better spiritual senses. And when that happens, to just go back to the context again, then our minds are blind to what is really rational, what is really true. People who are saying, I need more evidence. Give me more proof. Sometimes if they're asking in good faith, they will get more evidence and more proof. But a great deal of the time, because they're unwilling to face the blindness of their own spirit, they instead assume that their way of knowing is the best way of knowing. In Isaiah 50, verse 11, it talks about people who are going to walk by the light of their own torches. They're going to light their own torch. They're going to use that torch to guide them wherever they go, and they're not going to pay attention to God's light. That's a vivid picture of what goes wrong when we think that our own mind and our own ideas are the measure of everything else. And so when we say, give us a sign, we're really saying, Jesus, uh, I have a higher standard of rationality. If you measure up to my standard, then I might believe you. When we tell God that he needs to demonstrate himself to us, it says quite a bit about us. We're the kind of people who use our own torch and insist that our enlightenment is what God has to measure up to. We also have the problem of being blind to reality. And one aspect of being blind to reality is that treasure on earth problem. Sometimes you hear the phrase, rich as hell. And the people who say rich as hell are just using the word hell casually and, you know, they're trying to spice up their language a little bit. Jesus says there are people who are rich as hell. They've got treasure only on earth and nowhere else. And the only thing they'll end up with is hell. And so... This blindness to reality, the fact that, hey, money and all that stuff that many people just constitute their whole lives with, that's going to go away. Moth and rust consume it. Markets plummet. When you're in the middle of an election season, all the candidates are boasting of how they're going to make you rich. Sometimes rich as hell, but they're going to really make things wealthy for you. Now, again, there's nothing wrong necessarily with having candidates who know how to manage things and, and help a society to prosper more. But if 
our heart is set on earthly treasure, Jesus says, we're blind to the reality of the situation. And then when we're dark on the inside, when we're blind to God's light, when we're walking in darkness, we get into such a predicament where we call darkness light. Listen again to some of the language even of our politicians. What they consider evil or what they consider good is often a complete flip of what real good and real evil is. One obvious example, one of our candidates used to be the attorney general of a state. And in that state, there was a person with a video camera who secretly went and taped a conversation that he had with a person from Planned Parenthood. And he taped the conversation which the Planned Parenthood person was selling body parts. Uh, when that came to light, the attorney general prosecuted the person who did the taping, not the person who was selling baby body parts. That's the kind of thing that we have in our politics. And you know the kinds of things that people boast of or say are immoral. They, they get completely reversed. The Bible says in Isaiah, woe to those who call good evil and evil good, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. But that's almost what inevitably happens when you don't know God. When you don't know God's word and his standards, you're still going to be moral in a sense, but your morality is often going to be upside down. It's going to be the exact opposite of God's morality. Well, enough about the darkness inside. I want to talk more about being full of light. And our Lord Jesus, again, uh, when he speaks of that, says that one key is that you see the light. You have eyes in your head, or rather eyes in your heart, that work. He uses the language of the eyes in your head. And he says, if your eyes are working, then your body's full of light. But what he's really talking about is, are your heart eyes or are your spirit eyes working and letting in the light and seeing the light? And then not only do you see the light, but you also see with the light. The light helps you to see what you're like on the inside. And it helps you to look around and see the world around you and the situation around you in a whole different way. And not only that, as you see the light, and as you see with the light, seeing the truth about yourself and about reality around you, something happens, and you begin to shine with that light. Those are the things that Jesus means when he's talking about being full of light. Now, let's think again about what's involved in seeing the light. Well, how do the bodily senses work? they experience reality in a certain way. And in order for you to see, a number of things have to happen. There has to be something to see and some light that can be there so that you can see it, but then you also have to have your eyeball, your optic nerve, uh, the brain area connected with all of that. You need your eye to be working in order to see well. And if not, then no matter how much light, no matter how beautiful it is, you're not going to be able to take it in. Or when we think about hearing, I mentioned the person with a hearing problem who no matter how loudly you talked into the microphone and no matter how booming your voice, just wasn't going to hear very well. It involves sound being made, but also ears and the equipment working properly to take in those sounds. And that's true of the other bodily senses as well. Your sense of smell depends on something being there that emits smell, but then how you take that smell in also depends on your own situation and condition. Is your nose working and what is involved in all of that? Now, at risk, I trust, no, not of offending too many people, one example of that would be a pregnant woman. What smells good or bad to her or tastes good or bad to her can change dramatically from when she's not pregnant. In our house, if the Cap'n Crunch was in the house, I didn't need a pregnancy test. I knew, I knew my wife was pregnant because she hated Cap'n Crunch. And then all of a sudden, in comes the Cap'n Crunch. Now, Cap'n Crunch 
is Cotton Crunch. You know, it's just full of sugar, and it, it, it is what it is. The whole difference in whether you liked it or not depended on your condition, not what happened to be in the box. Others, you know, who just love chicken, you know, chicken just tastes delicious. And then you're pregnant, and it makes you nauseous to have that same smell of chicken being made. And others of you could tell a different story. The point, however, is that whether something tastes good to you or smells good to you depends on your condition and not just on the thing that you're tasting or smelling. And so you have in your bodily senses what's out there, but also how your own sensor is working. We also have the sensor of touch. And touch tells us whether something's hot or cold and whether it's smooth or rough and a whole lot of other things with that sense of touch. But someone who has been severely injured in the neck and is a quadriplegic loses the sense of touch in their hands and feet and in all their body below the neck. And, and so touch can't really inform them very much anymore. So it is with the five senses. And the same thing is true when it comes to spiritual realities. We have a God sensor. We have a spirit that is designed to sense God, to receive communication from God, to interact with God. But if that sensor is damaged, then that doesn't work so well. If that sensor is working properly, then it is similar to the way the, your bodily senses work. Think of some of the statements in the Bible. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You experience God and his goodness, and it's like tasting something delicious or looking on something beautiful. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. And elsewhere he says, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. There is something in the spirit, the ears of the spirit, that can hear the voice of the good shepherd if you're tuned in to his wavelength. The Bible speaks of our sense of smell. And there too, it's not just what kind of aroma something is emitting, but what condition you're in as to how you receive it. The Bible says we are to God the aroma of Christ. We're the aroma of Christ, and to some people we stink. To those who are perishing, we stink. To those who are being saved, we smell great. That's what the Apostle Paul says of himself. When he's bringing God's word, he knows that there is a, an aroma that goes with him. It's the aroma of Christ, and he's under no illusion that everybody's going to say, Oh, I love that smell. Some are going to say, boy, that stinks like a dead body. And others are going to say, I love that smell. So, again, our spiritual senses, whether um, you use the language of sight or hearing or taste or smell or even of touch or how you feel, is conveying in the Bible something not just about your body and how it senses reality, but about your spirit and how your spirit senses spiritual reality. Some of you may remember two men walking along the road to Emmaus, and Jesus, after his resurrection, came and walked alongside them, and they didn't recognize him or know it was him, at least not at first. But by the time the conversation was over, and he had explained to them many things from the Bible, and then he broke bread and gave it to them and vanished, they knew it was him, and what did they say? Were not our hearts burning within us while he was walking with us on the road? Even before their eyes recognized Jesus, their hearts felt that they were in the presence of the burning fire of God. So spiritual senses experience reality. And the next thing to keep in mind, as we've already been saying, is that sin wrecked our spiritual senses. And sin blinded our eyes to God's beauty. 
Sin can make God's aroma stink to us. Sin can plug our ears to keep us from hearing the voice of the Good Shepherd. And what we need more than anything else is not more light or louder sound. We need God to restore our spiritual senses. Sin wrecks them. The Holy Spirit renews and recreates and restores your spiritual senses. And sometimes that may happen only dimly at first, but you're starting to see at least something. You're starting to hear at least something of God's voice. You're starting to feel something of His presence. And when that happens, it's important to realize what's going on. God is restoring your spirit. He's awakening your spirit. So you don't just say, oh, Jesus said I'm the light of the world. All of a sudden, something is starting to seem brighter and more real and more beautiful to you. And you're beginning to taste that the Lord is good. And you're beginning to see that the Lord is good. And then you're not asking for a sign. Oh, God, give me one more sign to persuade me. Then you're not saying, oh, God, give me a fatter and fatter and fatter bank account. The Bible does say, hey, God knows that you need clothes. God knows that you need something to eat. Seek first his kingdom. He'll make sure you got something to eat. He'll make sure you have plenty to drink. He'll make sure you have clothes to wear. But make sure that your treasure is in heaven and that your master is God, not mammon. And when the Holy Spirit is renewing and restoring those spiritual senses, then we can truly experience God. Again, when it comes to your physical senses, how do you describe a rainbow to someone who cannot see? How do you describe a symphony you know, you could, to someone who can't hear. You could write down some things about a symphony and they could read those things about a symphony, but they will not know what it sounds like, unless maybe they're Beethoven and can write symphonies when they're deaf. But most of us can't hear a symphony in our head if we've never had the sense of hearing in the first place. That taste, seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, those are things that are part of experience that really can't be known by another way. And when God comes to us and renews our spirit, then we begin to experience more of God and more of God. And we need more than ever to just ask, God, renew my heart, renew my spirit, give me a God sensor that works. God gave all of us a God sensor. The old theologians used to call it the sense of divinity. Um, and that God sensor is given to everybody just like the five bodily senses are, but sin makes that thing not work right. And we need the Holy Spirit of God to restore our spirit. And once he has restored our spirit, then we're going to be more uh, open to and receptive to what the Holy Spirit is telling us. And the spiritual senses know God by faith. Faith is a way of knowing. Faith is not just a leap in the dark. Sometimes faith will have doubts or not be fully certain, but faith is a way of knowing, just as tasting or seeing is a way of experiencing and knowing. Faith gives you direct access to the reality of God. You have sensed his presence. You, his love has burned in your heart. And you're going to have times where he may seem distant. There's still a lot that our spiritual sensor needs to have restored and healed even after we've become Christians. But the process has begun. And in knowing God by faith, it's not just blind faith. Sometimes for some people it might be okay to at least start there. You say, well, uh, what I've heard sounds true and the evidence makes sense to me, so I'm going to believe that God is real even if nobody can prove it for absolute certainty to me. And so you might take that step of faith, but ultimately faith is something that the Holy Spirit works in your heart where when you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and when the gospel of Jesus Christ shines on you, 
you say, that is real. And he is wonderful. And he is beautiful. Faith treasures Jesus Christ. And that's why one of the measures of whether your God sensor is working properly is whether you've yet gotten over the treasure on earth thing, where that's the big thing in your life. When you have seen the beauty of the Lord and the value of Jesus Christ, then the things you formerly treasured don't seem so valuable anymore. So, in short, God the Holy Spirit gives us a new heart and a new God sensor or spirit in that heart to receive the touch of the Holy Spirit. So the things of God aren't just things out there, but they're things that we perceive with the abilities that God gives us. And not only then do we see the light, that we, don't we, re we recognize Jesus as the light of the world, but then we see with his light. And part of that is recognizing what's going on inside yourself. Sometimes we can see better inside just because the Holy Spirit has awakened our spirit. Go back to the Old Testament, to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all his innermost parts. God gives you a spirit, and that spirit is like a candle or a lamp, and that spirit can discern, can sense things going on inside of you. Well, you say, duh, I know what's going on inside of me. Actually, most of us, a lot of the time, don't. That's why therapists make a good living, and there are lots of them, because uh, we sometimes need help seeing what's going on inside of us. And it's okay to have a counselor or somebody outside you listen to you and say, well, here's some of the things I think are going on inside. But let's remember what the Bible says. Your own spirit is something that God has given you and that God himself uses to search out what's going on inside of you. And a couple of things that are going on inside of us that we really do need to know, one is the issues, the hang-ups, the sins that we need to face and confess and ask forgiveness for and fight against. And when we have light inside us, we begin to understand more of God's standard. God also gives us enough of his love so that we're secure enough to actually face our problems. That's sometimes one of the biggest blinders is we can't face those things because we think if we do, all, uh, we just fall apart. If you know in seeing Jesus that you're treasured and loved, then you actually want to discover what's amiss because you know you're loved. You know you're held forever by God. And so it's not going to destroy everything to find out something unpleasant about yourself, something that God already knew, something that quite a few people around you might already know too because they've had to deal with you. Wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> you know? Once you know, then God can get to work and you can get to work on growing in that area. But it's not just when the Holy Spirit isn't just one who goes around saying, yeah, this is wrong and that's amiss. The Bible says that God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And it says the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. The Holy Spirit tells you on the inside I am a child of God. I am loved by God. He is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. His life is in me. These are things about the inner self that when you've become a Christian and the Spirit of Jesus has moved into you, that He will reveal not just the things that need fixing or correcting, but also the things that God is doing and the and who you are and how precious you are to him. And then there's also not just that inner vision of knowing what's inside you, but also the outer reality. The Bible speaks of the mind of the Spirit and the mind of Christ. The mind of the Spirit is life and peace. The apostle says we have the mind of Christ. He says that at the end of a passage where he says nobody knows the thoughts of a human except that human's spirit within him. 
And nobody knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And then he goes on and draws the conclusion. Now, God's Spirit makes people into spiritual persons who can receive the things of God. So God makes his thoughts known to us in our spirit, and the Holy Spirit connects us with the thoughts of God. And so we're not just seeing the light, but we're seeing with his light. You know, I, I've got, I think, a two or three sermons in a row just on the mind of Christ, so I'm not going to give them both, give them all here, or we'll be here way too long. But just think about that phrase, the mind of Christ. The mind of the Spirit, where more and more what you feel is attuned to what Christ feels. Where more and more how you think is attuned to what Jesus thinks. And that's not always God just dropping uh, words into your head aloud where you hear an audible voice and you say, well, that was God, I guess um, it must be true. God often speaks more subtly than that when you have the mind of Christ. It's that your very own thoughts are his thoughts because he has given them to you and he's causing your mind and, and moving your mind to think more and more like Jesus. You shouldn't make the mistake, of course, of thinking your mind is completely already like the mind of Christ. There is another mind still in you that you fight against the rest of your life. But when we have the mind of Christ, we're going to start seeing other people the way God sees them, as fallen and yet beloved. We're going to see the world as God sees it, and we're not going to call light darkness and darkness light and evil good and good evil. We're going to start seeing it the way God sees it. And that's what happens when we're seeing with the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith sees. As I mentioned before, faith knows. It's a form of knowledge. And when you think about faith, one of the great chapters of the Bible is Hebrews 11, about the heroes of faith. And one of those heroes is Moses. And in line with what we've been talking about this morning, listen to this. Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. That's the kind of thing I've been talking about. Moses had been brought into the family of Pharaoh. He was living in the palaces of Egypt. Even today, people marvel at the treasures of the ancient Egyptian empires. And all of that could have been Moses for his entire life. Wealth and gold and silver and statues and pyramids and all that majesty and money of Egypt. He considered it better to suffer with God's people, to suffer in union with Christ, than to have all that money. Why? Because he saw him who is invisible. Now again, he saw, how did he? God had even said to Moses himself, no one can see me and live. But somehow God gave Moses a sense of his glory, of his beauty, of his majesty. And it wasn't through physical eyes, but through the eyes of his heart that Moses knew the greatness of God, and he knew that nothing else compared. And so all the majesty of Pharaoh, all the wealth of Egypt, nothing. I'd rather suffer with this God that I've come to know. And that is what happens when you're full of light. You see the invisible with the eyes of your spirit. And you count all the wealth of the world as nothing compared to the value of having Christ and the value of having eternal life for your own soul. What does it profit if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? That's the great question Jesus asked. Moses understood that question uh, centuries earlier. He was willing to give up the whole world, the greatest empire of the world, to suffer with a bunch of slaves because God was with those slaves. You are better off living in miserable poverty with a lot of slaves if God is among them than to be in the greatest palace if God is against it. 
and faith knows that. And when, of course, we've seen the light, and when that light has shined within us and has helped us also to see around us in the light of the way things really are, in light of who God really is, then we begin to shine with the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, but he also said, you, you are the light of the world. He says that in the Sermon on the Mount. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the room. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. The Apostle Paul says, once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. What a statement. Not just that you have light from God or that you see light. You are light in union with Jesus Christ. And so the Apostle, speaking of the Holy Spirit's work, he says, now the Lord is the Spirit and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same likeness. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. As we're beholding the brightness, we're beginning to take on that brightness. And the light of Jesus, the light of our Father, shines from us as it shines on us. The Apostle in his epistle to the Ephesians, says earlier when he's praying, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. He wants us to have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Again, there's that point that we don't just need signs and this and that. If we have a spirit of wisdom and revelation, we'll have knowledge of God. And then he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be opened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glory. There's the treasure theme, treasure in heaven, the riches of his glory. Open the eyes of the heart so that we can see how much those riches are worth. Open the eyes of the heart so that we may have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. What a blessing it is that God not only is light, that he shines his light into our world, but that he helps us to see that light when we had gone blind. And that he helps us to see with that light so that we'll know ourselves as he knows us. Fallen, and yet by his grace, when we come to faith, beloved in Christ. He gives us the mind of the Spirit, the mind of Christ, so that when we look around, we start seeing the way Jesus sees. We start thinking the way Jesus thinks. And then as that whole process is going on, the light of Jesus shines from us. The aroma of Jesus comes from us. The voice of Jesus can even sound when we speak because Christ himself is in us. O light of the world, we pray that you will fill us with your light in every way. Help, Lord, our inner faculties to be renewed and restored that we may see your light. And, Lord, uh, reveal to us ourselves in our sin as well as, Lord, in our blessedness as your children. And we pray, too, that you'll just give us more and more of the mind of the Spirit, the mind of Christ, that our thoughts, that our attitudes, that our feelings may be filled with your light. And then, Lord, help us to shine. This is a world where there's much darkness that needs your light. Help us to shine. And then, Lord, give eyes and ears and heart knowledge to many people who currently can't see you. We pray in Jesus' name.